Take your Bibles, if you would, and turn with me to the final chapter of the book of Philippians as we conclude this series on thankfulness and joy and rejoicing. And the most curious book of all for the, the idea of joy and rejoicing and thankfulness, the book of Philippians, written from prison, Paul writing to the Philippian church, who are also being put in prison for their faith in Christ, has already in chapter 1 explained, explained why it is that there, there's this um, thankfulness in his heart. In chapter 1 we see his perspective, and his perspective is that to live is Christ, to die is gain. Then in chapter 2, it's his attitude. It is, let this mind be in you which also is in Christ Jesus. Um, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. The humility uh, of the attitude of the Christian is, uh, in, is hum- humility, just like his perspective is living as Christ, dying as gain. And then in chapter 3, just last week, we talked about how the result of this perspective and this humility is that Christ is the goal. He's, you know, that I, I'm counting everything uh, as loss, that I may win Christ. It's all about the goal, which is Jesus Christ. Now, he's going to draw three applications from this in chapter 4. He's, he's laid all the groundwork. He's given us the concepts. And I know some people have said, I, I was telling somebody about the sermon I planned to preach last week before I preached it. And they were just looking at me, their eyes kind of glossed over, and they said, D- D- does your church actually like your preaching? I'm like, I'm like thanks a lot. Uh, and they said, no, 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 they said, it just seems kind of pie in the sky, right? It's not as practical. I said, well, the practical part of Philippians comes in chapter 4, right? Chapters 1, 2, and 3, it does seem like these concepts are put out, and it's not very practical. Um, but chapter 4 is where it's now put into application. Let's see a few applications, he says. Verse number one, he says, Therefore, my, beret, my, my brethren, excuse me, dearly beloved and longed for my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. I beseech thee, I beseech Iodias and beseech Syntyche that they be of the same mind in the Lord. And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. And what we have here is the beginning of chapter 4, he starts with the word, therefore. And it's the thing that's always said in Bible college. When you're studying scripture and you find the word, therefore, you have to look and see what it's there for. Here's uh, Luke's been to Bible college. He knows that statement. <clears throat> and the therefore is the, is the word that links chapter 4 with the rest of the arguments he's made in the book. So Paul is, is, is saying, look, our, adi- our, our perspective is Christ is our life. And if we die, that's gain. Our attitude is humility. Our goal is Christ himself, and therefore, because of all of this, my beloved breth- my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for, so, uh, and my joy and my crown, so stand fast. This is the introduction to his conclusion. He's saying, because of all of this, because of your reasons for thankfulness, stand fast in this way. So, that word so meaning in this way, stand fast in the Lord. In, in what way? Well, in, just as he described in chapter 3, um, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after it that I may apprehend that for which I am apprehended of Christ. And in this way, with, with Christ as the goal, with, with this understanding that he is everything, we stand fast in him. And he says, all right, here's, here's a few applications. He starts with our walk. Uh, it's the word that I chose for it. It's just how we treat uh, each other, how we how we live our daily lives. Verse two, he says, "I beseech Iodias and beseech Syntyche that they be of the same mind in the Lord." Now he's already in chapter uh, two gone through all of this detail about the mind of Christ, this humility, and now he's saying, "Now because Jesus is everything, because no matter how bad things get, Jesus is." 
and to live is Christ and dying is actually gain because everything is about about winning Christ and everything else is lost. He says, because of that, uh, Yodius and Syntyche, don't you think you guys can get along? Apparently, there was some sort of feud between these two people. And uh, since there was since there was feud, I'm just guessing that they were both women. I just assume, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, we don't know. We don't know. But Yodius and Syntyche were apparently not getting along very well. <laughs> oh boy, I'm surprised. We got tomatoes coming out. All right. Um, <laughs> but they were apparently not getting along very well. And he's saying, well, hold up. Now that we've, we've laid all this foundation, can't you have this same mind that Christ had of humility, of submission, and this goal that the goal is Christ himself? And in that way, can't you, be a, can't you find some common ground? You have the same mind. You may have different minds about this detail or how that should be done or what this should be or how that should play out. Maybe, maybe one of you is, a, is a, a Patriots fan and the other one is a, is a Jets fan or something like that, you know. Who's, who's a Jets fan anymore, right? I mean, I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, you have, you have something in common, and that is it should be the mind of Christ, that you're both humble in submission uh, to God and in submission to each other as part of the body of Christ. And he says... This is how we apply these concepts. Verse uh, 3, And I entreat also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. So he mentions a few people who were actually helpers of him when he was there in Philippi, or maybe they traveled with him and, and then stayed at Philippi. But he's saying there's at least a few women that were helpers of him, Clement, and then others, he says, that are fellow laborers. And he's asking the rest of the church to treat them especially well because these are people Paul knows and he knows their quality, he knows what they've done, and he's saying um, all of you should be of one mind. It should affect how you treat each other, the, the facts that we've laid out already in this passage. Then... He, he, after talking about how we walk or how we, how we uh, communicate with one another, how we fellowship, he starts talking about how we worry. It says in verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord alway, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be made known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Now that word moderation means just really what it sounds. It's kind of uh, medium, right? That, uh, you know, people say, well, you know, Christians shouldn't be lukewarm. Well, in this case, in this sense, you should be. <laughs> in this sense, you shouldn't be uh, flying off the handle. It's, it's a self-control. It's a cool. It's a calm. It's a, I'm not worried about all these things, right? Something happens, I don't freak out. That's the word they use these days, you know, freak out. And uh, no, I don't worry about it. Instead, I have moderation. I'm like, okay, well, how can you be so moderate in the face of all of these things that are happening to you? Well, I mean, to live is Christ, and if I die, that's gain, right? And I'm submitting to whatever God has for me. I'm, I'm having the mind of Christ, which is humility. And then, you know, my whole goal is Christ, and that can't ever be defeated in my life. God is always bringing things into my life that draw me closer to Christ. So everything's going right, even though it seems like it's going wrong. So let your moderation be known unto all men. Um, Then he says, be careful for nothing. Now that that word careful, there's another word translated careful in this same passage we'll look at in a moment, different meaning. This one here means to be worried, to be filled with care, right? To be filled with worry about something. So he's saying, be filled with this worry or concern or anxiousness. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, make your request, let your request be made known unto God. So instead of worrying about it, go to God in prayer about it, and don't forget while you're there to thank him for it. Because somehow, this is all working into all everything Paul's laid out. It's, to me, the live is Christ, the goal is Christ, the, we're submitting to Christ, all of it's about him, and so whatever the reason is, there's something to be thankful for. So don't just pray about it, but also be thankful. But not, and there's no reason to be worried about it. And he says, 
um, let your request be known unto God. And verse 7, this is, this is the tough one because intellectually we know that we shouldn't worry about things. We know that God is in control and all of this, but it's much harder to put that in practice in our daily lives when we just start worrying, right? And so he's saying, take this to God in prayer and thanksgiving. And then verse 7, and the peace of God which passeth all understandings, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. You know, just, just as we're going to God in prayer about these things and thanking him for them, God begins to change our attitude and keep our hearts and our minds with his peace. And, and he, he, it's just this amazing miracle that God does. When we're all worried and fretting about stuff, and we go to God, and we, we pray to God the principles of this book, Lord, this is really bothering me, but I know that living is all about you, and dying is gain because I'm with you. I, I know that I need to submit to whatever it is that you have for me. I need to have the mind of Christ, submit to others, and submit to, you know, just, just a mind of submission, a mind of humility. And I know that ultimately the whole goal is just you. And so through that, through that admission and through that prayer, God brings this amazing peace into our hearts. And uh, that, that can only be explained really by the Holy Spirit, which then adds to that statement, let your moderation be known unto all men. Other men are looking at you and being like, how do you do this? How do you make it? How do you get through these crazy things? And when we're flying off the handle, there's no, there's no question. They're like, okay, you're just like me. But when we act unusual as Christians, when we have that calm, that moderation, that peace of God that's in our lives, we aren't worried about things all the time, then it's going to make a difference. It's going to be a great testimony to God, and we should be different. Then it says this, um, verse 8, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, Whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Now, he's, he's, he's giving us a command to really just celebrate Thanksgiving, right? I don't know how many of you do this at Thanksgiving, where you go around the table before you start eating and everybody has to say something they're thankful for. Um, that's always one of my favorite traditions at Thanksgiving. And uh, we're all starving, you know, because it's like 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and we haven't eaten all day because we want to save room for the turkey and everything. And now we got to give something we're thankful for, and we're not really thankful because we want to start eating. But, uh, but I, I always love that because, because it does stop. We pause and we remember what this is all about. And that's really what Paul is saying. He's saying, listen, I know there's a lot of things for you to be worried about, you know. Um, maybe so-and-so from the church, maybe it's... Uh, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of a Greek name, you know, maybe Yodius, uh, the week after the, uh, the uh, letter gets, Yodius gets arrested, gets put in prison, you know, and Paul is saying, I know there's, you could worry about this guy who's in prison, or this, this one over there, or this thing that's happening, or how the, the church could break in at any time, uh, the, the government could break in at any time to your, find your meeting place, and break you up, and try to throw you in prison for it. <clears throat> I know there's a lot to worry about, but because Christ is taking care of all of that, and everything's going to work out. He's, he's got everything. The, the worst thing that can happen to you is for you to die, and that's gain. He's saying, and because of that, don't spend all your time worrying about these things that you're worried about. Instead, think on the things that are true. Think on the things that are honest. You know, it's a, there's a lot of dishonesty out there in the world today. Okay, um, and we need to recognize that. But instead of worrying about all the, the world that's around us, why don't we just spend our time meditating on the things that are true? Here, here's something that's true, right? Here's something to meditate on. Whatever things are true, whatever things are honest, whatever things are just, the pure things, the lovely things, the things that are of good report, the things that have virtue and praise, make those be the center of your thoughts. Instead of worrying about the negative, why don't you have your... You know, think about all the wonderful things and blessings that God has given you because the negatives aren't really even negatives, right? That's the whole point of Paul. Even the things that we think are, are coming against us are actually going to turn out to be good. So find the good in them, right? And that's what Paul's done. He said, I'm in prison and they're preaching, a, 
preaching Christ um, out of contention to, against me, but yet I see virtue and I see praise in that. You know, in that I see the the gospel going forth, even though it's done the, the wrong way, and even though it's done in order to hurt me. And so he's saying, why don't you take your mind off of all of those things that cause you to worry, and instead find the true things, find the pure things, the just things, find what God is doing in the situation, and think on that. And, uh, you know, some people, sometimes people who are optimistic get a really bad rap, right? You're not being realist. You're not being a realist. And I, I admit, sometimes people who are, I tend to be a, an optimist, and sometimes optimistic people, we, we, we deserve it because we just, everything's going to turn out good and never even are serious about things, you know? But, but ultimately, everything will turn out, right? God is in charge of all of these things, and they are going to be okay, right? And, uh, and we can trust that. That doesn't mean we don't, we don't use a little bit of common sense in our daily lives, and there needs to be a balance there. But we should spend our time not worrying, but rather on, the, on those things. Uh, verse uh, 9 says, Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and here's that, peace of God that was mentioned in verse 7. Now he says, the God of the peace. The God of that peace that you have will be with you. It's not just the peace of God that will be with you, but the God of the peace is with you too. And that's a comforting thing. So why worry when the God of peace is with you, right? So he's saying, because of everything we've learned at Philippians, we now know it should affect the way we walk, the way we live, it should affect the way we worry. We're not so worried about these things. Our focus is on, on uh, the God of peace. And then verse 10, we, we see this other thing, and this is our want. Look what it says. He says, But I rejoice in the Lord greatly, that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein ye were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Now this word care isn't the, the word that means worry. This word care is in reference to actually being loving and caring about Paul, caring for other people, saying, I, I'm, I'm concerned about your well-being, right? And so he says, your care of me, you've been concerned for my well-being, it has flourished again, wherein ye were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Now, he's, he seems to be suggesting that they have sent something to him um, as, as a gift by the hands of a messenger, and he's thanking them for it. He's saying, I rejoice in the Lord that now at, at the last your care of me, you've given something, some monetary gift or something to help me. It has flourished again, wherein ye were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned to, in whatever state I am, therewith to be content. He says, not because I, I had this great want that I, need, that I wanted you to give me money, but I'm, I'm just saying thank you because you gave it to me and you did so for the right reasons. He's saying, I didn't, I didn't want the money, but you've given it to me and it's, it's a wonderful blessing. For I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. He says, I've been through it all. I've been through suffering need and, or having something that I needed, or that, I, that I, had, I, I felt like I needed, that I did, was unavailable to me, and I, I made it through. And I've had many, many things. I've, I've abounded. I've had more than enough, and I'm fine too. So whatever it is, the Lord's going to bring me through, whether it's, whether it's a, a suffering need or want. It's funny how he's, he's kind of hemming and hawing about this. And to understand a little bit more about what Paul's trying to say, you kind of have to understand the uh, patriarchal society that he lived in. And that, that you think patriarch, you think back to Abraham, right? That's not what I'm talking about. Um, but what, they, what was happening in Greek culture around this time is that when, when you give a gift, it was, there was sort of like a contract and agreement that if someone were to give you something, you're now indebted to that person, like you owe them, right? Uh, for instance, if you were to be like uh, Lydia, for instance, was a seller of, of purple, and she, uh, she would have been a matriarch, right? If, uh, if somebody came to Lydia and said, hey, look, um, I'm, I'm a brand new startup uh, baker. I want to I wanna, I wanna bake bread for, for people. Would you buy some of my bread? 
Lydia might say, well, look, I'm, I, I will, I'll find all of my purple buyers, right? All the people who buy purple from me, and I'll convince them to buy bread uh, from, from you. But, you know, you're going to have to, uh, and I'll even give you a place to live, and I'll give you all this stuff, but you're going to have to bake bread for my family whenever we want it. So there was this agreement that went back and forth. She would, she, you know, as a, as a patriarch or a matriarch, the person with the money would then help out the, the, the smaller businesses get started and would, would take care of everything, but there was an expected return from that. There was this give and take. And so in a society where when you give something, something is expected, Paul is wanting to not be brought under the power of a gift. He doesn't want someone to give him something and it to be expected that now, oh, we have ownership over Paul. So what he's saying is, thank you for the gift. I didn't need it. <laughs> I want you to know I didn't need it. I didn't want it, but I'm, I'm grateful that you gave it, but not to me, you gave it to God. So what he's doing is he's, he's redirecting the, the gift, and he's saying you gave it to God, and God will respond by re- giving back to you. He's not saying that, I, that he could ever repay the gift, because he can't. He's in prison, and he may die. And so in this society, you, you can see kind of what he's getting at when, and how he's hemming and hawing a little bit about saying thank you for the gift. But notice what he, he brings out. He, he talks about suffering need and having want. Verse 13, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. That's, I can live in any scenario. I can, I can suffer need or I can abound, be in abound. You know, I can have lots of money in my bank account or have nothing and be on the side of the street. In all of those scenarios, I can do all of them through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Again, he's bringing us back to Christ, who is the goal, he is the focus, he is the emphasis, all of those things, right? But this doesn't mean that I'm going to win the basketball game, right? So this is, this is the verse that's so, so often taken out of context, right? I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. You know, this is something that um, I used to, when I used to play basketball, uh, with my dad, and I got a free free throw. I would I would I could do all things through Christ who strengthens me, and then take the shot, you know. And it never worked. <laughs> um, but it's because I didn't believe it hard enough, right? No, that's it's it's because that's not what the verse is talking about, right? The verse isn't talking about I can just I can fly like Superman because Christ strengthens me. No, it's saying. In, in whatever situation, I can honor God in that situation. I can continue, I can exist, and I can, for me to live as Christ and to die is gain in all things because Christ is the one strengthening me. So, again, we're going back to the beginning, the first three chapters of the book and showing how Paul is drawing out those, those um, uh, principles and applying them very practically. Now he goes on, notwithstanding, ye have done well that ye did communicate with my affliction. He says, now I'm not saying that it was wrong for you to send me the money. Uh, now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. For even in Thessalonica ye sent once and again unto my necessity, not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. He's saying, you see, when you give a gift uh, in, in this way like this, it's, it's fruit of the Spirit in your life that's abounding to your account. He says, I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. He says, here we go. You sent this gift to me from Epaphroditus, and it was a sweet smell to God. It was a sacrifice to the Lord. It wasn't even to me. It was to him. And then here, here's something I find really interesting. Verse 18. But I have all in abound. Uh, excuse me, verse 19. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Jesus, by Christ Jesus. He's saying, who's going to pay you back for this gift? In this society where you give a gift and you now owe something, um, a debt in return, um, he says, who's going to pay you back for this gift? It's Christ. My God, you've, you've offered a sacrifice to him, not to me, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory. Now notice he does not say, if you give more, you'll get more. If you'll just sow the seed, God will give you the abundant light. You know, this is the, uh, this is the prosperity gospel that's, tried, that's, that's pushed on us by 
by most of the TV preachers that you'll, that you'll come across. Um, no, he's not saying that, that if you'll just give, God will give back to you. He says, no, 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 you gave this gift to me, but it was really a gift to God. And God will, in turn, make sure all your needs are met, if he can afford it. <laughs> he says, according to his riches and glory, he's going to supply everything you actually need. So if God can afford it, you're going to have everything you need. So if you ever ask yourself, boy, why isn't God meeting this need? Then the answer is because God can't afford it. Or else maybe the answer is you don't actually need it. Right? <laughs> because clearly God can afford anything, right? It's not that God doesn't run out of riches, but according to his abundant riches and glory, he's supplying everything you need. So if you need, look, you might say, boy, it would be great if I had a million dollars, but God says, yeah, it wouldn't be. Or else I'd give it to you because I have more than a million dollars. I could give you a million dollars, but no, because it's not actually your need, right? What you need is not to have a million dollars right now, <laughs> right? And so it, this is a, is a bit of a, a confusing statement unless you tie it in with the principles Paul's already been teaching. Chapter 1, to me to live is Christ. To die is gain. Uh, I'm going to be humble. I'm going to submit to the, the purpose of Christ for me. And you know, the whole goal is Christ. I, my, I'm, I'm running this race that I may win Christ, not that I may win all these other things. And this is the problem with prosperity preaching is that they'll take a passage like this and say, see, if you'll just give to God, he'll give back to you even more. And if you'll just give a little bit more to God, you'll get even more back when it comes back around to you. And the whole idea is now you're giving for you. You're not giving for God. But the goal is Christ. It's not me. So when we give to God, we have no promise that we're going to get more money back in return. But we do have a promise that it'll be fruit that will abound to our account and that it will be that God will meet all of our needs according to his riches and glory. And of course he will. So we see that all of these principles apply to our walk and how we fellowship with one another. They apply to our worry, what, what we're concerned about. And they also apply to our want, the things that we need. Because once we realize that even just every, everything about life is all about Christ, for him, for us to live as Christ, to die is gain. Once we, once we have these foundational principles, the rest falls into place. Our need is met, whether we know it or not. I need X, Y, and Z. But God is going to supply all of my need if I really need it. And now we look around and say, okay, well, God put me in this situation or in this scenario that I think is a bad thing, but he's supplying my need. Apparently, I need to be here right now, <laughs> whatever it is that God is doing. Apparently, this is a need for me, and, uh, and we see God in all of this. And then he closes, verse 20, Now unto God our Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. This is what we ruin when we don't live the Philippians way. We don't live the thankful, joyful, for me to live as Christ, to die as gain way that Paul is describing here. What you're doing is you're robbing God of his glory. Right? This is an opportunity for God to be glorified. It's not about me getting all this comfort and ease and, and you know, money or whatever it is. Right? It's God supplying our needs so that he gets glory and, and in a ma manner that most glorifies him. Now, for some people, I know Christians who God supplies their needs in a manner that is very comfortable, <laughs> where they live nice, comfortable lives, and God is glorified through that. But I know most Christians <laughs> who God is glorified through other means. And whatever it is, we say, thank you, God, because it's all unto God, our Father, be glory forever and ever. Amen. Then he says, salute every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren which are with, with me greet you, and all the saints salute you. Chiefly they that are Caesar's household, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. I love that statement in verse 2. They that are of Caesar's household. Paul is in prison, and he's kept under house arrest at this point in the palace. And the people of Caesar's household are getting saved and are saying, hey, when you write to the Philippians, make sure you let them know that I'm saluting them and, you know, we're praying for them. This is amazing because Paul, in prison, in a very negative situation, God is using to glorify himself and to win souls to him. And they're saying, hey, make sure you tell the Philippians 
we really appreciate what they're doing. We're praying for them. And meantime, the Philippians are being put in prison for following Christ. And they can see that there can be fruit from all of this. God is going to be glorified. God is going to get, uh, get praise and glory from it. And so because of all of this, we're thankful. Not because everything's exactly the way we want it, but because everything's exactly the way God wants it. And we can trust that. Father in heaven, I do thank you so much for all that you've done. And forgive us for our worry. Forgive us for our want as we desire so many other things. Help us to get our perspective right. Help us to get our, our uh, attitude right. And help us to get our goal right. That it would all be Christ. To live as Christ. To die as gain. Help us to be humble. Help us to have this one thing that's on our mind. And that is to win Christ. That all of it would, uh, would result in the glory and praise of you.